All right, let's start. Yep, so thanks for coming for part two of the workshop today. I hope that you guys enjoyed part one and was able to figure out everything about, you know, all the react state and props and all. So today we're going to do something like that's like, okay, so like there's this introduction slide about me again. So um, yeah, just re remember that my name is Chris. If there's any question you have, just feel free to call me Chris. Okay. Yeah, so last week in part one, part one we covered the more React heavy stuff, which is like uh, what React is, uh, what JSX is, and um, key React concepts like states and props, and like lifting state and all. And then we made like this ugly looking to do this app, and we were able to deploy it with Vercel. So today, what we're going to be focusing on is really just uh, adding third party libraries and like using common React UI frameworks like Material UI to prettify the to-do list. And afterwards, we are going to try to add user login with Firebase authentication and saving your user to-do list data to like Firebase Firestore, which is like a, a NoSQL database that's offered by Firebase, which is from Google. All right. So uh, once again, uh, this is still a lot to cover. So um, yeah, I, I only kept one of these slides again. So uh, um, we, we will go very fast and you might feel that you might be a bit lost and you might not fully understand what's going on and that's fine. That is by design. Um, of course, there's also those like a code sandbox for you to catch up if you feel a bit lost and uh, if you don't feel like you have enough time to just implement whatever I've mentioned in like the short few minutes, then you can just try to read and understand the code and you follow along fine. All right. So, uh, of course the workshop has the same format. Uh, I will just explain some concepts and um, our live code with the mentioned concepts and uh, you'll be given time to practice, read, understand the code and all the links are over here below. So if you, you should try to keep this document open so that you know when I say that you should open certain sandboxes, you can just click on it to open it up. All right. Yeah. Um, in fact, today's workshop, I would say it's not exactly accurate because uh, it's not really an intro to React. So the things that I'm going to mention, like third-party libraries and using Firebase and all, those are actually just, um, they are not directly related to React. It's really just um, things that you could do to integrate certain third-party libraries with React. Okay, so what are we going to make today? Today, we're going to make this, uh, like turn this ugly to-do list to the one on the right where it looks a lot better. Uh, not, not the prettiest thing, but it still looks a lot better. And it has a lot more interactive elements to it. Like uh, I can just demonstrate a bit. So basically, when you first visit the web page, uh, you don't see your to-do list. Uh, that might not be the best design, but that's what we're going to make today. So first you need to create an account, you need to sign in first, then yeah, after you sign in, then you finally can have access to like the to-do list. And over here, all the UI elements here are using material UI components. So you can add like a teach React workshop. And when you mouse over the button, you can see like there's like some uh, hovering effect and stuff and when you click on it uh, it propagates this circle thingy from where you click it and also everything's done for you you can just use it then when you click on add then um, it will be it will appear in your task list and uh, in fact uh, if you were to like go on to another device suppose you go on your phone or something and you log on to your same account again you will see that this is actually safe on a database on Firebase. So uh, today we are not going to save it to local storage anymore. We're going to save it on the internet, save it on Firebase Firestore. All right. So yeah, before we begin, uh, I actually feel like last week I missed out like something that I felt was very important to talk about because I didn't have a lot of time. And this week I feel that I'm not going to have much time as well. So I'm gonna like front load this very important message that I feel is uh, very important for everyone to realize and understand, okay? Which is that 
you know, when it comes to web development, it always feels like the learning curve is super steep. You have all these different terms. You have these terms that look like Greek to you. And yet um, you see on like Stack Overflow and people just throwing these terms around and you don't really understand what they mean. And it can feel a bit overwhelming. You feel like pulling your hair out, right? But what I can say about it is that, okay, you really don't need a lot of the stuff over there. Just pick things up as you need them. And um, don't feel like, you know, there's a right way of doing things. Like, um, like, there, like there's a certain way to, to like um, lay out your code properly or name your variables correctly and all. I mean, chances are there is, but you, you shouldn't feel like you need to get it right the first time. Okay. It's okay to fail and like uh, just do things wrongly it's okay to do so because uh, when you do things wrongly you actually learn a lot more from the whole experience you you see why certain things need to be done properly and in fact i always tell people to be proud of your failures okay because um sometimes i feel that you know your your failures especially in software engineering tend to make for the best stories so what i mean is that um Sometimes people are always shy about talking about, you know, certain code that they've written that they don't necessarily feel so proud about. But why not use that to spin off a, like a very interesting story about your own growth, okay? So an example I always give is that um, when I first interviewed for Carousel, so when I spoke to the hiring manager, I actually told him that um, I actually only, I, I don't have much experience in web development and I, I've only made my first website over like over a year and I told him that I really didn't like the way I made it I think that it, it's, it runs very badly it's, it's slow and everything which is why I was there to learn so I basically just critiqued my, my own work in front of him and I think that to be able to do that it, it makes for a very interesting story and it shows that you have a certain eagerness to learn right so Please don't feel like you need to like, you know, get certain conventions right the whole time. It's okay to just fail and get it wrong. And just, yeah, just, the key thing is really to just get started. Okay. And while you are doing your whole this web development journey, please always try to remember why things are the way they are. Okay. Like uh, you shouldn't just, you know, look at React and just try to like memorize how React works and everything. You should always think about what's the purpose of this abstraction. What's the, why was React created and what problem is trying to solve? Okay. You shouldn't like try to over specialize in certain frameworks because like, you know, nowadays you go and see around like LinkedIn and everything. You, you see people try to like parade that they know React.js very well. Or I'm a React.js developer or anything, but I think it's good that if you know like the intricacies of a framework, but try not to like over specialize in it because um, the thing the thing is framework frameworks come and go. So like uh maybe like five years ago React wasn't popular. Uh, five years ago maybe Angular was the thing, and three years ago, um maybe Jekyll was the thing, but now they are not popular anymore. So frameworks really do come and go. So, um, always try to look at the bigger picture and try to remember what is the purpose of these abstractions and what problems they're trying to solve and try to contextualize whatever you learn to your CS education. Okay. Like, um, while you are making like a web app, you should think about in terms of like your CS knowledge, what is React actually like working as, okay. React is actually like a, like a scheduler, like what you learn in your OS classes, which are going to take like probably next year and all. And, when you try to contextualize it to your computer science knowledge, it, it makes you become a more versatile software engineer and a better, better computer scientist. Because the thing is, um, when you do a lot of web development work, you actually spend most of the time just trying to align buttons and try to make it look good on your web browser. And you try to think about, okay, why did I go, why, why did I go through CS 20, 2044? Why did I go and learn how to write Dijkstra when um, I only just like aligning buttons the whole day, right? But that's but if you if that happens, you kind of miss the point. Okay, you should really just try to contextualize and think about it in, in your CS eyes, in like to think about how things work. Okay, and I guess this is probably the most important thing I want to talk about, which is that 
Um, Orbiter is a software engineering mod, in a sense. It's a software engineering program. It's not your CS 2030, CS 2040. In those mods, the code you write, the only purpose is to pass test cases. But in Orbiter, it's a program where you have an opportunity to um, work on a problem you are passionate about and build a product around it. So really, I feel that writing the code itself, this is, should be the least of your concerns. And uh, of course, it will take out the most of your time, but you should really think about you know, the first four steps first, which is get into a space, something that you're passionate about. And then think about what problem in that space you're trying to solve and then come up with a solution for it and think about it in terms of a product view, like how your users would actually use your app and whether the way they use it, the way they interact with it, whether it actually solves a problem that you care about. And I think that these four steps are actually the most important. And because you guys are very bright kids, very bright SOC kids, and you guys will eventually get five done. Like the code will eventually be written. But if you don't do your planning properly, you don't think about the product properly, the code you, you written might be, might be awesome. You might be able to, I don't know, soft P equals NP in like oh, one time, that type of thing. Uh, that doesn't really make sense, but yeah. But if it's not solving the right problems, then you will have missed the point. So please make sure you go through this whole sequence in order and don't be stuck at just building the technical product. Okay, and I just want to plug uh, Han Ming's workshop one week later. So uh, one week later, Han, Han Ming's actually gonna deliver a workshop on like UI UX design. And I think that he's one of the most suitable person in uh, the School of Computing to teach this because he's very experienced in it. So if you really want to learn about how to build a great product, you should go and like listen to him next week. <laughs> yep. So, and last but not least, uh, before we begin with all the React stuff, please remember to take a break, okay? Um, although for Orbiter, we say you should have a 140 hours workload. Uh, if you do the actual math, uh, if you were to work on it on all weekdays, you don't actually need to spend a lot of time on it. Make sure you, this is like your, this is your summer break. Um, Orbiter should be like your side project and you should spend the time trying to, you know, ensure that you take good care of yourself so that when Orbiter ends, when the next academic year starts, when the hustle starts again, you are mentally ready. So please make sure you take good care of yourself and don't stress yourself out over Orbiter. Okay? Yep. Okay, so let's finally start. Okay, my most important message has already been delivered. So let's finally start with the coding and all. So yeah, let's talk about third-party libraries. Third-party libraries, what are they? So basically, there are libraries that contain some code that perform some common functions that has already been like abstracted by other people to make it easier for you to use it. Okay, so you can add like third-party dependencies uh, with like yarn or npm. Okay, usually you type npm install or you type like yarn add then in your command line and you just install like the packages. So what happens is that they actually get added to package.json. Okay, in package.json you have like uh, dev dependencies and dependencies. So uh, dev dependencies are things like your linters, your code formatters, suppose your prettier, your ESLin, things that doesn't, is, isn't required for your app to run, but it helps you in your development process. But dependencies are the libraries that your app actually uses, that's integrated with it, okay, to uh, make it function better. So, um, yeah, so you, you should like try to understand the difference between these two. And they're usually installed to node modules. Okay, so like these libraries, the, the JavaScript files the, or, the, or the TypeScript files, most of the time it's JavaScript files, they'll be installed to node modules. This folder called node modules, which uh, if you look at web projects, they can get very big and I'll explain why later. And they're also frozen in a log file. So this log file thing is actually a concept in many other programming languages as well. If you if you code in Rust, there's like a cargo.log. You put, if you code in like Python, there's like a poetry.log as well. So um, these log files, please remember to commit them. And I will tell I will, I will tell you why. So log files are important because our code usually depend on like third-party libraries of a certain version. 
Okay, so like, uh, suppose I write a, a library of version 2.00 and then uh, I can only be sure that my library of 2.00 works with like these two other libraries that are of another certain version. Okay, so our code depends on libraries of a certain version and these libraries of a certain version also depends on other libraries of a certain version and so on and so on. So you can look over here and you can see that it's a directed acyclic graph where um, basically it's like this whole graph of like your dependencies. Okay, and it's very important to ensure that we keep track of the right version so that when these dependencies are loaded, they we can be sure that it's as the author meant for it to be and it still works. Okay, so for example, this is a um, part of yan log, yan.log in like the NUS mods code base. And you can see the NUS mods code base somehow actually has two versions of the same library. Okay, it has load JSON file at version two, it has load JSON file at version four. So you are like, why? Why does the file need two different versions of the same library? Okay, and the answer to that is likely because uh, if you look at this graph, uh, probably like maybe one of the dependencies needed a later version and maybe another dependency down the line, they needed a earlier version and all for it to work. So because of this, the node modules directory can get very, very big. Okay. So you can, if, so when you get familiar enough with this whole like uh, web development thing, you can actually I appreciate this type of memes where they say that, uh, you know, node modules is like the heaviest thing in your computer or like uh, Thor's hammer is so difficult to lift up because of it's, they actually store node modules inside. Uh, some other memes and all, okay. Yep, so um, I just want to talk about some of the common React third-party libraries that people actually use. So a very common one is actually React Router. So React Router allows you to give pages like a fixed URL. Okay, like suppose you go to slash sign up, then you go to the sign up page. You go to slash login, then you go to a login page, that type of thing. So React Router helps you to do that. Uh, I'm not going to cover React Router today, but you can just click on the link and just see how to get started. Uh, and like another one is a React Helmet, where it allows you to like add meta text to your HTML head or change the title of the page and all. Okay. So yeah, today we are, we are going to be spending a lot of time with Material UI. Okay. So Material UI is the UI framework and it's mobile first. That means all its components are developed to first look good on phone first, but it can also be adapted to look good on like um, your desktop viewports as well. Okay, viewports is the thing you see that your, the, the, the surface that your app is rendered on. So we always talk about mobile and desktop viewports and yeah, so it, it's designed with mobile first and it follows Google's material design guidelines. And it has a very comprehensive set of components, even comes with a whole very comprehensive set of icons and even themes, okay? But the reason why I decided to talk about Material UI today is because they have very comprehensive code examples and documentation. So it's probably not the best tool, but it's the easiest one for all of you guys to start with. Probably you all don't really have much experience with these type of UI frameworks. Material UI has a lot of code you can just copy paste. But of course, uh, I say it's probably not the best tool and it doesn't look the best because it can look very Android-y. Okay, like if you look at Android phones, look at Android apps, it can look very familiar, similar to that. Okay, so like these are like what material UI type of apps will look like because they use like material design components. Um, and I'm gonna just quickly go to the website so that we can just look at really what material UI is about. So, okay. Over here, I make it bigger for you guys. And yeah, it's React components for faster and easier web development. And let's just look at the type of components they have. Okay. So over here, you can see this is actually their documentation. And which I recommend that everyone should read after this workshop as well. So material UI components. And you can see that, you know, they have a set of like buttons and you can just click on it. They are interactive and everything. It's, it helps you to visualize which components you actually need. 
And they even have different variants of buttons. Okay, so text buttons, you have outline buttons, you have upload buttons. And if you want to see how these upload buttons is coded in Material UI, just need to click on this show the source button. And you can see like exactly how you should you can copy the code and everything. Just copy and paste it, then look and look at the imports at the top, and you're done. Okay. And even for things like uh, let's see what are the interesting ones you can see we have we have chips okay so chips are like this type of ui elements that you can you know like click on and stuff and you you have things like menus so menus things that when you click on it you will just pop out to give you like different options and all okay and it even helps you to make things responsive. So over here, we have this uh, grid, grid layout component. So um, you can adjust the, like the spacing. It's very fun to play around with it. You should try yourself. And even like to specify how you can uh, lay things out on a grid so that at different, at different breakpoints, okay, breakpoints is a term that you will see when we talk about responsive design. So, um, Perhaps this might look like this now, but when it's at a small breakpoint, so a small breakpoint is probably like a mobile phone viewport. When it's at the mobile phone viewport, then probably these two would collapse together and be of a different size and all. Okay, so um, components like this really help you to make your life a lot easier and uh, Material UI comes with a lot of them. So over here, there's this, uh, you see a lot of this mixed styles thing. So this mixed styles thing also allows you to like write your CSS, CSS inside your JavaScript file itself. Okay, so this is CSS in JS, but we're not gonna use that today. But uh, I recommend that you look at it, you look at it and decide if you want to use it for your project or not. Okay. So yeah, the mixed styles they have their own CSS in JS solution, and um, the cons is. Um, of material UI is I've heard from people that you know it can be less extensible or hard to make custom stuff because material UI can sometimes be a bit rigid and all and um yeah oh, I have I haven't really experienced it myself so really do explore the different type of options that you have the different type of frameworks that you have and read their docs thoroughly to see whether they are suitable for your project or not okay so there are other theming or CSS frameworks that you can use. And some of these look a lot better than Material UI, okay? And some very common ones are like NDesign. NDesign is like this uh, framework from this Chinese company. I forgot which Chinese company, but it's really very comprehensive and it's very widely used as well. And uh, there was once I used this library called Semantic UI React, which looks like um, super pretty and all. Okay, like the typography and everything just is, it looks nicer and all. So you have, basically you are spoiled for choices. You, there, there are really many choices here. Just look through them and see what you are happiest with. But I think like what Daryl has said, the one that has given me the best developer experience so far is Tailwind CSS. So this is the one that I'm happiest with using. But you should use this if you are like already quite familiar with CSS because it allows you to really like build your own components and stuff. But if not, um, if you're not too familiar with CSS, I would still recommend you go with Material UI. Okay. <coughs> All right, so finally, we can get started on the coding part. All right, so first, um, we are gonna follow, this is a guided exercise. So I'm gonna just show you how to install like the third party libraries. So essentially you can go to like Material UI's uh, installation page. A lot of these open source libraries always have a get started page, an installation page, really just, just follow it. Uh, it helps you to get started really quickly. So of course with your command line, you can add this um, yarn add Material UI call and you will just add like Material UI, okay? So there are a few things that we need, need to do here and I'm gonna show you. So this is our sandbox from last week. Okay, so basically what we're going to do here is we're going to add 
material UI call, but in code sandbox, you do not need to run this on the command line. There's a dependency column here. Just paste it here and click on it and it will just add material UI. Okay, but when you're doing developing it locally or on, on your own like actual setup, just make sure you run, it, run this on the command line. And because material UI is designed around like the Roboto font, you need to add the Roboto font as well. So we really just copy this. And because uh, this is like a link tag, uh, the, I would think the most straightforward way to add it is just in your index.html. So it's kind of not in like your the React part of your app, but it's just in your index.html. You can just add it here. Okay, then the Roboto font will be loaded. So maybe since you're talking about Roboto font, I can take the time to talk about like Google fonts as well, Google fonts. So Google fonts allows you to like, you know, choose other fonts that can be downloaded to people's devices and can be displayed on any device. So if you use fonts over here, it doesn't matter whether you're using a Mac, you're using a Windows uh, or even using Linux, it will just download the font and it will just be consistent and display the same font all the while. So you can just uh, go to Google fonts and look at like, uh, suppose you wanted a very space looking font, you can use like Orbitron. So Orbitron is like this font, it even shows you all the different font widths and you can just, you know, like select this style and they will just have the code for you to just copy and paste it into like your HTML file. And this font will be added to your CSS, like not to your CSS, to your app, but you can just reference it in your CSS like that and you can use it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so we have, we've added the, the Roboto fonts, then they also want like font icons. So we just add it here and uh, they also say if you want to use like um, material UI icons, you can just install it here. Yep, so basically just paste it into code sandbox and you just add it in. And there's also another page, the usage page. Okay, over here, the usage page basically, basically just tells you like, um, like how to set up, set this material UI thing up correctly. So uh, they tell you that, okay, basically you just need to import the components and you, and you just add it in and you see it on your app. But there's also like um, things that you can do to make it better. So like a responsive meta tag. Okay, so basically meta tags are things that tell like uh, web browsers uh, how to configure like your app to be displayed on it. So in this case, uh, Material UI is recommended to be used with this like viewport text. So over here, you can see like create React app already like adds this, let me give it small space, adds this like viewport text to it. We can just like replace it here. Okay. Um, you can go and Google to see what these texts do exactly. And there's also like a CSS baseline component. It fixes some, inconsistencies across browsers and devices. So you can just click on it and they'll say, for you to like use this CSS baseline, you can just add it to like um, a part of your app essentially. So we are just gonna add this to like index.js, okay? So I'm gonna add CSS baseline here and I'm gonna, just gonna import it here. Okay, and you can see that the app kind of looks slightly different now. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it's already using Roboto. Yeah, let me just change the font family. Okay, font family, font family right now is set to, to sans serif. So it's any sans serif font, font that you have on your computer. Usually you'll choose the default one, but right now I'm gonna set it to Roboto. And then if it doesn't have Roboto or if or it doesn't, if it's not able to download Roboto somehow, it will fall back onto sans serif. So if I save it, uh, yep, right now it's using Roboto. Okay, so basically that's all we need to do to get set up with like Material UI. And yeah, I think we're gonna just give you like another two to three minutes to try this out. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys three minutes to just from Sandbox 11, try to do this. 
and or if not you can just look at sandbox 12 and see how it's like All right, we'll stop in another 10 seconds. All right, okay. So let me just demonstrate how you would actually install a library on the command line because that's actually what we'll be doing most of the time. Okay, so right now I'm in, I'm in the React workshop to do this thingy that we built last week. So, um, right now, I'm going to install like material UI, right? Sorry, yarn at, at material UI call. Yeah, so basically, like you just need to like add the library like that, and it will just be added to your dependencies. Okay, it will show you that it added this material UI call at certain versions, and it has this like dependencies. And if you look at your package.json, you will see that it's added over here. Okay, so yeah, that's how you do it with like the command line. So once you've installed the dependency, uh, it will be inside your no modules folder and you can just like import it directly. Okay. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is uh, we are actually going to just try to okay, come. We are going to swap this everything here, like the buttons with like the material UI buttons as well as this text view. Okay, so let's just do like component shopping again. So over here, just click on button and you'll see that you can just copy code from here. So we want the, usually when you use this type of UI frameworks, they have like primary color, secondary colors, which 
uh, determine, which tells the users based which like action would be the primary action to take. So over here, you want the, we want just want the primary action type of primary color. So we can just copy this and we are just gonna swap it out. So I'm gonna swap this add button now. So we're gonna go to task manager and our add button is here, All right? So over here is a primitive HTML button and I'm just gonna like paste it here. And right now it says there's a squiggly line because we haven't imported the button yet. So over here, you just need to import it from material UI core. Okay, so in the website, you will probably see that they import it like that, right? Import button from core slash button. So the way I import it is slightly different, okay? Because this actually makes it slightly neater. I can, when I need to import other components other than a button, I can just add it to this list. And I don't need a, I don't need a singular line for every single component I import. So they are the same thing, okay? Yeah, so I added a primary button here. Then what I'm gonna do now is, uh, where is, yeah. I'm just gonna change this to add, and I'm gonna make it type equals to submit. Uh, okay, so I swapped it out and we can still test if it works. Yep, it works. So that's how easily it is to add like a pre start button from some other third party component library. It's very easy. All right, then the next thing is we're going to get rid of this ugly text field. So component shopping again, and we go to text field. Okay. So why is why do I like material UI's text view? Is because you can kind of see like what this text view is for. But when so when you actually like want to type in it, right? The label actually just goes to the top. So it's just it just does a lot of things for you and it just makes for like a good user experience. So the same thing, we are just gonna copy this. Okay. You can just look at it and choose. So, uh, do you want the out? Do you like the outline one or do you like the standard one? For me, I'm just gonna use like the standard one. Okay, and we are gonna add this input here. And because we added text view, we need to import it as well. I can just add this to this list, text view. Okay, then. Yeah, basically I just need to like change this to description. Yeah, so because this is a task description, I can just, just change this to that and maybe I'll shift like this, this margin as well and as well as the, as well as the value and the on change handler. So I just shift it here. And it works. Okay. As in, you, you can tell that it works because like the state is being updated and because it displays like the new task text, it just, just works. Okay. And I'm gonna remove, we don't really need this label anymore. Since this label is already incorporated, I'm gonna incorporate it into the text view. So I'm gonna remove the label. And this is what we have. But I'm not sure if you guys can see it looks slightly weird because uh, right now they are not aligned at the same level. So uh, what I'm going to do here is that I'm just going to add some CSS to like make sure that they look prop they look correct and they are like aligned the same. So I am going to introduce everyone to this thing called CSS modules. Okay. So the thing is... Um, what you need to know is that CSS usually is like a global namespace, which means that suppose I have this class called my class in header. Uh, no, suppose I have this class called my class in 
in my, my header CSS file. And I have another class called my class in task manager CSS file. They might end up um, having some conflict with each other and it might not be exactly sure whose rules are being applied. So that's like normal CSS because CSS has a shared global namespace. So there's this thing that's, that people have created to solve this problem called CSS modules. So the convention here is that you name it your component name and then you name it .module.css. And then you, when you want to like actually reference your CSS styles, you import your styles from these CSS modules and then you reference the style. Is, instead of just passing in a string of the, of the class, right? Instead of just passing in a string called my class, you call styles.myclass. Okay, so what happens is this allows every CSS module to have its own independent namespace. And it's very helpful when you end up working on very big projects. So suppose you have projects with like, with like a, a tens or hundreds of components. You don't have to think, oh, um, this name for this CSS class, is it already used in some other component because they have independent non-colliding namespaces, okay? So that this, this is CSS modules and you can read up on it more on this link over here. This, yeah, it's built in to create React app already. So you can just, yeah, it, it creates a unique class name of this format. And then it just like helps you do everything when it, when you actually like build your whole website. Okay. So we're going to do that. And in fact, I'm going to like show you this type of way of like um, laying out your code that a lot of people do. So right now I'm going to, because I want to add CSS to this form, I'm going to create a new folder for it called task manager. And I'm just going to shift task manager into it. Okay. So over here, I'm going to create this new file called index.js. And what people do is they just import task manager from task manager and then they export default task manager. Okay, so this is going to look very weird to you. But what's happening is that, okay, I am going to create another CSS module here. New file taskmanager.module.css. Okay. Uh, what's happening here is that I actually want my style sheets and my JavaScript files to be in one self-contained folder on its own. So inside a task manager folder so that it's easy for me to lay, to find things in around the code base. Okay. Um, but what happens is I also want people to be able to import it. Like uh, if they wanted to import task manager, they'll just import from component slash task manager, okay? And for people to do that, when you want to import from component slash task, ma task manager, it actually looks for this default file called index.js, okay? So what we, what we are trying to do is we want to keep the name of this file called index, called like task manager, okay? We want to keep the file name of this file called task manager, but yet we want to make it easy for people to import, which is why we do this convoluted thing that looks kind of dumb, but there's actually, reason behind it, okay? Yep. Um, if you don't want to do this, you can actually just like have this whole thing inside index.js as well. This completely works. It's just that in, inside your code editor, right? You, you will just end up seeing a lot of index.js everywhere. So, which is why, you know, the recommended practice is just to store it in like your components name, JavaScript file, then you re-export it in index. Okay. Yeah, so finally we have our CSS module. We're actually gonna write like some styles. So for this form over here, I want to align them correctly. So I'll have a add task form. And basically what I want to do is I want to make it a flex box, okay? Uh, for people who are not too familiar with CSS, for laying things out, you need to know that flex box is your best friend, learn how to use flex boxes, they're very powerful. Okay, and for you to align them vertically, if I'm not wrong, it's align items. You need to set it to center or, or it might be justify content center. 
and sometimes it doesn't hurt to just add both. Uh, but we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, so inside our taskmanager.js itself, we are gonna import the style. Import styles from taskmanager.module.css. And over here, we just need to search for all our, okay, we don't have any, any existing styles here, but we're gonna just, no, sorry, class name equals to styles dot add task form. Okay, do you see that it actually shifted slightly and right now they're actually like aligned on the same line. Okay, so that's how you use CSS modules to organize your code better and to just um, um, have CSS rules that don't conflict with each other. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing for header as well. So I'm going to create a new directory, header. And I'm going to just drag it inside. And new file, index.js. And I can just copy this and paste it here. Okay, and currently, is there any CSS rules here? Yeah, there's a CSS rule that's, that's using called header box. So right now it's, it's relying on header box in like this styles.css. So we're gonna take this out and we're gonna put it inside its own CSS module. Okay, and just to be consistent with the casing, I'm gonna change it to camera case. So over here, we are just gonna change this to styles.header box. And because we have two boxes here, we have, where's the other box? Uh, yeah, the other one is at the bottom. Replace it here, and we're just gonna import the styles. Okay, and right now our thing still looks like it did before. We are we just basically refactored our code to make it look neater. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna just like give. Yeah, I actually did quite a lot in the past few minutes. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not expecting you guys to do it, but um, yeah, you can spend like the next two minutes. Okay, I give you three minutes. Three minutes just exploring and see like a. Um, how the code is laid out and everything. Okay, so the three minutes for you guys to start now.
Okay, I'm going to continue. So first, I'm going to answer Benjamin's question on why must you use braces meant for JavaScript? All right. So over here, if you look at class name, I actually reference styles.header box and you realize that it's actually in like curly braces. Okay. So why do we do that? Because uh, what you need to know about CSS modules is that it's kind of magical, right? Because like create React apps sort of just does it for you. So there's a lot of like things that is done for you magically behind the scenes like this, because like eventually this looks like a standard normal JavaScript import, but yet you are just importing from like a CSS file. Yet it somehow looks like a module at the moment. So uh, basically you just need to know that you, sh you should just follow how it works. But the answer is that Okay, right now it's being imported as if it's like a JavaScript module. So I, so for create React app to do the transformation correctly, uh, you kind of have to treat it like JavaScript. Okay, and that's why we use curly braces here. So I, I've actually for, I actually forgot to change this uh, checkbox here. So I'm just gonna quickly do it right now. So over here, uh, of course, there's like checkboxes as well. Just um. Again, we just choose the like the premier checkbox. So, yep, the premier checkbox. Then we just need to replace the. Checkbox with this guy and import it as well. So as much as possible, try to sort your imports alphabetically. Just as a good practice checkbox. Okay, so yeah, so checkbox is now here and we just basically need to pass in everything we have so far. And if you probably see a lot of these are ARIA labels type, type of thing. This ARIA label thing is actually just a, it's an accessibility label so that when people use screen readers, to use your app, they can actually understand what the items are for. Uh, okay. So of course, I don't want it to be checked by default. I'm just gonna remove it then. Okay, so I can add a new task. And it works. We've replaced our ugly checkbox with this checkbox over here. All right. Okay, so moving on, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna try to like add some boxes to group like similar sections together so that it looks like um, there's like a better segmentation and it looks easier to read. Okay, so what I'm gonna use here is I'm gonna use this uh, paper component, okay? Like in Material UI, there's these surfaces and there's a paper thing. So this paper thing basically like, they're just a surface for you to like put your stuff on and it, it just so happens that it's suitable for what we want to do at the moment. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this paper. And what we're going to do is for this overview box and cat fat box, we are going to try to like change them into like, to fit inside this, um, paper first. Okay, so instead of having a div over here, okay, no, I edited the wrong file. Yeah, we're looking at the over the cat fat box now, cat fat box. So instead of having a div, I'm just gonna replace it with a paper. Okay, and of course we need to import it from Material UI. Okay, and you can see over here right now the cat fact is in like its own paper. But you realize that we want to do it to this overview box as well and we'll be copying a lot of code and um, yeah, right. So we actually want everything to be inside this paper thingy. Uh, so just to add some additional customizability, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a new component. 
Okay, we're going to add a new file called uh, box. Okay, and inside this box, I'm going to wrap around this paper thing here so that I can like, um, in fact, I'm going to do it properly and just like make it into like what we've done so far as well. Box, then we have our index.js, which import box from dot box and export for box. Okay. And in box itself, what we're going to do is we're going to I am going to introduce you guys to this thing where inside the props, you can actually have children. Okay. So this is a by default in React thing. So in React, props can have children. So I'm going to destructure the children from props. And over here, I'm just going to return this paper. But in between the paper, I'm going to render the children. Okay, So it looks a bit confusing now. I'm going to show you how this is actually used. And of course, we need to import Somehow we ate up my thing. So I need to type it out again. All right. So yeah, this is what we have. So basically there's a box. And right now I am just going to, in my header, I'm going to, instead of wrapping it around paper, I'm going to wrap it around box. Okay. And of course, I'm going to import that component that we've made. Import box from. Yep. So right now it's showing an error because I think I forgot to export it. Yep. Export default box. Okay. So. This guy is successfully wrapped in box. And right now we're going to wrap the overview box in the box as well. Okay, so let me explain what we are doing here. So over here, this props now takes in the children. Okay, and the children is rendered in between these two paper. Okay, and inside header, we actually have these two children here. So these two guys, that's in between this box actually gets passed as a children. And your box now becomes like a parent component. Okay. Yep. And we're going to wrap this overview box inside the box as well. Box and box. Okay. Now there's two boxes over here and we're going to wrap add task, task list in the box as well. So add task. Going to import box from box. Okay. Um, okay, and then for the task list as well. So box and box. Okay, so now everything is in the in boxes already. And right now you can see that even though we use the paper thing, it kind of doesn't look right. Because over here, you realize that there's basically no padding between here and like the edges of the... Yeah, there's like no padding between the contents of it as well as like the edges of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to style our box. So same thing.
and we're gonna add some padding to it as well as you you see that these two boxes they are like right next to each other but they are touching each other so it needs need some margin okay and then inside box itself we're gonna just import the style And we're gonna add the class name here. Styles.box. All right. Yep. So over so it kind of looks relatively decent now. Uh yep, but we 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 wanted these two to like take up half the screen each, right? So right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just uh, specifically apply our header box thing that we did just now to the two header boxes, okay? So right now over here, we have this box. We, we can specify, yeah, I think we can do this. Eh? No, we can't uh, because then we have to pass the, yeah. So I think we can do last name dot. Oh, I think it works. Okay. I am gonna do it on cat fat box as well. Okay, it doesn't work. So yeah, um over here I'm passing class name to box, but for box to actually apply it, hmm, it has to concatenate that class name as with this box. But for now, uh, I think, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna skip that for now. And we are gonna just set the flex basis directly inside this. Yeah, it's, it's not the, yeah, we're just gonna, gonna copy this over. So over here, I'm just gonna copy this and put it here. And you'll take up half the screen space again. Okay, this is not like the proper way to do things. There are actually better ways to do it to concatenate, like to forward the class name and to concatenate it. You which can be done with like this uh, library called class names. Okay, but for now this works. And you, as you can see, this looks kind of decent, but we want to make it look slightly nicer. So we want to add some shadows as well. So box shadow, we can actually add box shadow CSS. Yeah, so in CSS there's this box shadow thing, which uh, let me open up the MDN reference. In this CSS box shadow, you can basically just like uh, write out like the blur radius, the color, the offset X and offset Y. So what I mean is, uh, actually I'm gonna, yeah, I, I want the version with the spread radius as well, so I can control how the shadow looks. So over here, I'm just gonna paste this here. And you can see that we have like some shadows at the side and it's like directed to like the bottom right corner, but that's because we have an offset. But if I were to remove the offset, zero, zero pixels to zero pixels, Okay, you can see like our shadows is now around the box. So let me just give it like more spread and all. So like, yeah, so that's like roughly how we want it to look. Okay, so we have a semi-decent looking app now where every section is segmented into its own um, box and it's easy for like the reader to look at it and feel that there's like a sense of visual hierarchy around it. Okay. Yep. So basically that's what we have done so far. Uh, yeah, we, again, we did quite a lot here. So I'm just going to give you guys a uh, one minute to try to look at the code and just read it and see if, uh, uh, just play around with it if you want to.
Okay, so the one minute will start now. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay, let's move on. So right now, we have a semi-decent looking-ish to-do list. It's still quite ugly, to be very frank, but we'll work on it along the way. All right, so next up, we're going to actually start introducing you guys to Firebase. So... Um, a lot of you guys will be building web apps that will require you to like create user accounts and you know probably save data in a database somewhere. So it's probably on the internet, right? And uh, you guys are probably thinking, oh, how do I write a back end around it? How do I handle authentication? And those are very complicated things that for like um, people who are new to web development to you, like you guys, it can be very like daunting to just like implement on your own. So of course, there's this thing called Firebase, which is uh, from Google. And Firebase actually just helps you to do a lot of these things and like abstract a lot of those very um, boring and technical details. I mean, not really boring, but yeah, like it abstracts it for you, okay? So let's look at the type of products that they have. So they have built products, okay? So, uh, they, they have a real-time database. You want to do like machine learning, there's something for you. You want to do like authentication, there's something for you. You want to like run certain uh, serverless functions, okay? Without having to set up a, a backend, there's like cloud functions as well. You want to um, host it on Firebase. You can even like host it on Firebase, completely fine. And if you use this, then you won't be using Vercel. Uh, yeah, just, just choose one. Yeah. Or you want to store like user, suppose like you want your users to upload like uh, their profile pictures and stuff and you want to store them somewhere, you can use cloud storage and all. So it's very convenient. Okay. Firebase has a lot of these type of products to just quickly get you started. And if you want to, yeah, th these are more for like, a, you know, bigger scale projects and like if you're like running a startup or, or you're run, you deploying an actual web app, then you probably want to use like Google Analytics to see how many people visit your app and you want to like monitor the performance to see whether there's certain pages that are very laggy or very slow, for example, or you want to like distribute beta versions or alpha versions of your app, that type of thing. So, uh, and there are also, the, the last part is engage. So Firebase allows you to do A-B testing. So A-B testing is like a, um, Suppose you, you roll out a new feature and you want to see how much impact the feature has. So you will show half your users, the old version. Then you show half, the other half of the user base, uh, the new version with the new feature. Then you can sort of like measure to see whether your new feature actually did something different or not. Okay. Then there's things, of course, like authentication, we talked about it and messaging. Okay. So there's in-app messaging, there's cloud messaging. I am not too familiar with this. But if you are interested in using something like that, go figure it out on your own. Yeah. Today we're gonna to use authentication and uh cloud fire store, which is a database. Okay. So 
for most people, right, this could actually entirely remove the need for like a back end. So this really makes developing a web app actually very super simple. Uh, you don't actually need to like, you know, like think about how to host your own server and then run like your own back end. Okay. And the, the thing is, it's also free up to a certain amount of use. Uh, suppose if like you are a startup and you are like serving a lot of um, users, then you probably like need to start paying for it. But it, from what I heard is even the rates are very, very reasonable. So a lot of big companies also use Firebase. Okay. So when we talk about authentication, right? In web authentication, it's actually very complex. Okay. It's not as easy as it sounds like because you need to think about well, how do you save the user data in a data database? How do you save your password hashes securely? How do you do email verification? How do you, when your user forgets their password, how do you reset the password? And then there's things like JWT token verification and token refresh. So basically, uh, whenever you want to verify that your user is like the, the, the actual user that they claim to be, you need to verify something called JWT tokens. And you kind of it's kind of like a cumbersome process that you need to manage and you, for a lot of you guys you probably also want to add social login so like sign in with google sign in with apple sign in with facebook firebase makes it very easy for you to do this because it really abstracts all the difficult parts of authentication for you and if you don't want to use something like firebase authentication you can even like you can use like libraries that do this authentication for you uh, simplifies it slightly like passport.js Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add like the Firebase um, dependencies and we're gonna like try to segment it into login pages and the to-do into like its own pages. Okay, so I am gonna show you, you this thing called um, React Firebase. So basically, I, uh, usually when I want to implement something like that, the first step I will do is I will try to just uh, see React with like Firebase. And then it just so happened that somebody already made a library that abstracts even that for you. Okay, so there's this library called React Firebase. Okay, suppose you want to use it to, to do authentication. Uh, you can just install this helper library, React Firebase off. Okay, and you can just very quickly get started with like using Firebase in your code. So um, I'm going to show you this example here so add google and anonymous off basically they have this whole walkthrough on how to set up your react firebase thing and they have a lot of helper functions like uh, if you are authenticated then you will show that oh you are signed in but if you are not authenticated that means you are signed out then you will show you are not signed in okay so these are like helper helper JSX markup that helps you to write your application. Okay, and that's what we're going to use today. But first, I'm going to show you guys how to set up the Firebase project first. So basically, just like click, uh, go to console or click get started or anything, and then you can just uh, add a project. Okay, so um, over here, you can really just name whatever you want for your project. So uh, ideally, when you work on your actual orbiter project, just name it your orbiter project's name. If not, just like name it anything. Anything will do, okay? Yep. So the project name, I just name it anything will do, just to show that you really can name it anything. You can choose whether to enable Google Analytics or not, which um, for now, I will just not enable because it's slightly more complicated. But when you actually start like your Firebase project for your actual orbital project, you might want to consider enabling Google Analytics. So you can actually collect data on how many people are actually using it. Okay, so it takes a while to start up. But meanwhile, I'm just gonna add the libraries here. Um, yeah, so essentially you, you need to add the Firebase dependencies. Okay, so Firebase app, then you need Firebase off. So these are the Firebase libraries that are from Google. Then right now, 
on top of the Google Google's libraries, we are also going to add in the helper library. So the helper library is React Firebase. Uh, you can enable it after you deploy the app. You don't have to choose it only at the start. So there's some flexibility for around it. Uh. Yeah, the, uh, re I'm replying the question about Google Analytics. Okay, so I've added these libraries already. And my project is also set up. And what I need to do here, okay, so what you can see here is that I'm actually on a Spark plan. Spark plan is a free plan. And I'm going to add a web app to it. Okay, I'm going to add a web app. I'm just going to name it. You can name it whatever you want, like really. So I guess we will just call it web app. Okay, and then you just click register app. Yep, and then basically it will just generate all the API keys and everything for you. So over here, these are the API keys that will uniquely identify your project that you will use to interface with Firebase. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is, uh, okay, so over here, I'm just going to follow this step. Okay, so add Firebase to your app, right? And then basically they say you should have a config file that looks something like that. So you can just actually just copy it. And I'm just going to save it inside a new folder called config. Then inside this config folder, I'm going to add this file called uh, firebase.js. So here basically is where my Firebase config will live. Okay, and I'll just export the config here. But of course, I need to put in the actual values. So I'll go here. I'll just copy this and I will put it in. Okay. Yeah. So right now the this is my Firebase projects config. And in case you, you're wondering whether it's safe for you to check it into your GitHub or like a source control, uh, usually when we talk about API keys, we do not check them into source control, but Firebase is a special case where it's actually okay to check it into source control because Firebase, right, essentially is just your front end app trying to interface with Google's server. So no matter what happens, you still have to somehow include your API keys in it and it's actually safe to do so. Yeah, because the worst thing that can happen is just uh, other people use like your config and just create a lot of like random accounts or anything, which yeah, from what I understand, it's not unsafe to check this into like your source control. So if you're using Firebase, I think it's fine to really just add this to your Git. Okay. Yeah, so this is what we have. And basically we just need to follow instructions here. So right now we, we, we have this thing and we're gonna just, yeah, we've added the library already and we're gonna wrap our app with a Firebase auth provider and use a Firebase auth consumer whenever we need like the Firebase authentication, okay? And in fact, I'm just gonna skip ahead Okay, actually we are just gonna copy code here first. So copy this and we want this like Firebase authentication to be at like the topmost level of our app or, or at least near the topmost level of our app so that the rest of our app can access it. Okay, so I'm gonna put this in like index.js. Then over here, of course you need to Firebase of provider. And of course we need to Im import it. Okay, and we need the, yep. Yeah, so over here is telling me that um, it doesn't work because there's no low dash dependency. So I suspect that this is, this will not happen if you use the command line tools to install, but it's a, it's a code sandbox thing. So if you see this, just install low dash as well. But if you use the command line to install this library, I think it should, it should add the low dash as well. Okay, so right now 
uh, we need to pass in the Firebase config that we got earlier. So I'm just gonna like import the config from conf no from config slash Firebase. Okay, and right now it's still not working because it says we need to import Firebase from Firebase.app. Okay, so really just copy the code and paste it here. And this will still not work because I've actually tried this out yesterday and their docs are actually outdated. So one of the perils of using like third-party libraries is that there's a chance that it might be outdated. So for you to do it correctly, you need to like actually import the specific Firebase object. Yep. So, uh, okay, I've successfully imported Firebase, but it says that Firebase.app.off is not a function because whenever we need like a Firebase um, product, we actually have to separately uh, include their, their code as well. So Firebase in slash off. Okay, so this step is slightly complicated. So I, I'm going to repeat again, you need to like add the off provider so that the rest of your app can see like the Firebase uh, helpers. Okay, so this off provider. And then you need to pass in the config that we got where we created the project just now. And we also need to import the actual Firebase library that's from Google's code and pass it into the helper. And to enable the authentication, we also need to import the part of Firebase that's just meant for authentication. Okay, so that is what we've done so far. And right now we're gonna segment it into login and to do into pages. So because right now we actually want a login page, we are actually gonna design a login page right now. And right now our to-do list is entirely within this app.js. Okay, I am going to, I am gonna separately change this into like uh, another component. Okay, so usually what happens when we want to add pages is we, can, we will usually add another folder. Maybe you can call it page or pages or anything. And in pages itself, we add files. So we can call it page to-do list js okay then this is the code we actually want to add in so we're just gonna write function page to do list and we're just gonna return this and then of course we need to export it export default page to do list Okay, so right now I try to save it. It doesn't work because once again, React expects you to return only one item. So I need to wrap it in like a fragment. And this works. And there's a lot of like missing imports. So of course we'll just quickly import them. Okay, so I imported header and I also want to do the same for, for task manager. Okay, um, it's, it looks a bit tiring to do this now, but I, I think when you actually code it in VS code, it's actually a lot smarter, like the code completion and everything is a lot smarter. So components and task manager. Okay, then of course there are still red squiggly lines here because we need to shift our Tasks or set tasks into that place and this thing as well. Okay, so I'm just going to remove this whole thing and I'm going to put it here. And of course, we need use state and use effect there as well.
Okay. And over here, of course, we need to show our page to do this. Okay, so we are back to where we are. Okay, we just refactor some code into their own respective pages. And I'm gonna create another page over here. So another page just for logging in. Page, page of maybe page authentication, page of, yep. So um, this is a page that people will see if they are not logged in. They, it will just tell them to log in. So. Um, function page off, and I'm just gonna return. For now, I'm just gonna return like something that says that you are not logged in. Okay. Okay, and. We have our two pages. And right now, we just want to display them here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use the helper functions that we saw earlier. If Firebase off. Okay. So if you're authenticated, then we'll show the to-do list page. But if you are not authenticated, then you will show the login page. Okay, I need to import it as well. Page off. Oh, okay. Uh, I did the export wrongly. Right, so now it shows you that you are not logged in. Okay, and this is expected because over here, we are not logged in, so you, you will show page off. Okay, and yeah, so basically that's what we'll do for this exercise so far. Basically add them and segment them into pages. And right now, you'll see our app actually doesn't work because there's no way for us to log in. So it's expected for us for it to look like that. And yeah, I'm going to give you guys three minutes to just read the code and just be, just to familiarize with it and see what we've done so far again. Okay, Sandbox 15 is a completed code.
Okay, another 20 seconds. Okay, I'm going to continue. So, um, what you need to know about, the, about Firebase is uh, now that we have our project, okay, uh, we can click on continue to the console and then we can choose the actual, actual products that we want to use. Okay, so like we said, we are trying to implement authentication. So, you can over on the left, you can just click on authentication. Okay, so click on get started. And it will enable like the Firebase authentication features for you. But by default, everything here is disabled. Okay. And yeah, so it's up to you to choose what type of like authentication methods you want. And as you can see, it's really very easy to add a lot of them. You even have like Yahoo sign in, you even have like GitHub sign in, that type of thing. Okay. But uh, most of the time, people would just like enable like email and password. Okay. So you can click here, you can enable it. And there's even a passwordless, pa passwordless sign-in type of thing that uh, Firebase Authentication provides, which means that uh, you don't even have to type a password, you just type your email, and then you will send an email with the link, and you go to your email, you click on that link, and that's how you sign in. And that's very convenient because we don't have to like bug our users to change the password all the time, that type of thing. You don't even have to save passwords. It's, this is a passwordless sign-in. But today we're not going to talk about how to use email and password sign-in because it's a lot simpler to just implement Google sign-in. Okay, so we're going to enable Google sign-in as well. So make sure you go to your project, authentication, sign-in method, and just tick enable for Google sign-in. Okay, you need to select a support email, just put whatever there and uh, the rest don't have to be filled up. Uh, you can change the names here if you want to, but because this is like a to-do list, I don't really care. I'm going to click on save. Will this work with NUS authentication service? Um, no, I don't think Firebase has an integration with NUS authentication service, but you could possibly make them like like live with each other like side by side somehow yeah at the top of my head i think that's what that's something you can do as well yeah so yeah uh, i've enabled i've enabled google sign in as well as email password sign in but we're not gonna do this we're just gonna uh, do google sign in because it's really super simple okay so over here in my authentication page of course we'll need like a button for them to log in. Okay, so right now we just create a button and we, we're gonna be like, um, of course we use the material UI buttons and then we'll just use the contain variant. Color, we can just use primary, I guess. Primary, primary, okay. And we are just gonna say, we, okay, we're just gonna put um, sign in with Google. Okay, so that's your big button for you to press for you to sign in with Google. And basically what we're gonna do here, of course, go back to the documentation and do what we do best, otherwise known as copying code, which is over here. So sign in with Google. When you on click, you just um, create this authentication provider and you sign in with pop up. Okay. So, of course, to do it the proper way, you need to have handle sign in. Or you could put, put handle sign in with Google as well. It's up to you. Okay. Then basically we're just gonna run these two things. 
And over here, it needs Firebase, right? So you can actually pass it in as like a, as like a function parameter. And over here, because we, we okay, when we on click, when we click on a button, we actually want to pass in the Firebase. Okay, so handle sign in, and then we are gonna pass in Firebase. Okay, but the thing is we don't have Firebase yet at the moment. So for us to actually have access to the Firebase object, we're gonna use the Firebase of consumer and slash Firebase of consumer. Okay, so uh, this, how you actually know that you can use this is uh, over here, because we already have the off provider. So every child component in the tree below would be have access to the off provider. It's just that you need to use like a consumer to read from it. So there's this thing called a Firebase off consumer where it takes in like, okay, I'm gonna just open the API. Okay, so Firebase off API, Firebase off consumer, it takes in like the off state and the off state actually has like sign is sign in the provider ID, which tells you which method they use to sign in as, as well as the user object. And it also provides a Firebase object over here. Okay. It also provides a Firebase object over here. Somehow their API documentation doesn't write that, but we're just going to straight up use it. Okay. So, how do you interpret this is, okay, we're just gonna, gonna copy the code. And, okay. So the, over here between this Firebase of consumer and the other Firebase of consumer, there's this function over here. Okay, do you see the red curly braces? Red curly braces. And what this component does, this Firebase of consu or consumer does is it basically like um, runs this function with the Firebase object, with the is sign in object, with the user object. So uh, this syntax might look a bit cryptic to you, but it's really just plain JavaScript. Okay, what's happening here is that this is a function. And over here we are, this is the, the function parameters and we are passing in an off state object. And inside the off state object, we destructure it and we take out the Firebase object. Okay. Then over here, this is the, the part of the code where we return what we want to return, which is actually just this button over here. Yep, I needed to copy this in as well. Okay, so I hope it looks clearer to you now. Again, this Firebase of Consumer allows you to access the Firebase stuff that's passed from like the top of the React um, component tree. Okay, uh, if you are curious, it's probably stored in something called a React context. Okay, but never mind. Over here, basically, we are just capturing the Firebase object and we are passing it into handle sign in. Okay, this is gonna sound a bit dry and all, I agree, but yeah, it takes a while to process, but once you understand it, it's kind of understandable. And right now, we are just gonna click on the button to sign in. Okay, sign in with Google. And you see the window pop up and it immediately disappears. And I'm gonna show you the reason why. So basically just open up your code sandbox in like another app. Now in another tab, okay. Then we see our glorious big button here. And if you look at your console output, you click on it. It tells you that this domain is not authorized to run this operation. Okay. So because Firebase is like a, like a legit product. So they actually like only allow certain domains to make uh, authentication requests. So you, when you need, when you actually deploy your app, 
uh, of course, localhost works because localhost is for people who are doing development. So it allows authentication from localhost. But when you actually deploy your app, you need to add your domain name over here. Okay. So most for most of you, if you deploy a Vercel, it'll be Vercel.app. Okay. Uh, but for now, because we are running on code sandbox and you want to allow code sandbox to sign in, you can just add csb.app. Okay. So now that I've, I've added csb.app, I'm going to do a hard refresh on this page. And I'm going to click on this button again. And magically, the sign in works. And you can click on your Google account to sign in. So suppose I click on Christopher Go. And suddenly, you see your to-do list again. Okay, so what's happening here is, finally, this button works. So we are able to sign in. And the moment we are able to sign in, this page, this app page, actually detects that we are actually authenticated. And it ends up showing the page to do list. Okay, so that is Google authentication. Okay, Google social login. So that, that's essentially what we've, we've done so far. But um, because I'm running out of time soon, I'm just, uh, I, I think what we've gone through so far in the last few minutes is still palatable. So I'm going to continue for now. Okay, so right now, I'm going to add this. Okay, so you realize right now we can log in. We can log in, but we cannot log out. So we need to add the functionality for it to log out. So usually when it comes to like, uh, these are apps, right? Most of the time you see like a logout functionality in like some bar, some prominent bar somewhere. So that's what we're going to try to do now. And we're going to introduce you to this concept called the app shell. Okay, app shell. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this top bar over here first, this to-do list top bar with a logout button. And over here, if you look at your if you go for comp component shopping again, you will see that there is this app bar. Yeah, surfaces, app bar. So over here, you see like at simple app bar, you see like app bar with a premise search field. So depending on what you want for your project, just pick one. But for us, we just go with this. Okay. It even comes with a login button. So right now, we are just going to copy the whole thing. Okay, and um, we are just going to, because this bar, right, it should always be displayed at the, our app at all times, no matter which page you're on, because it's sort of like your navigation. So we'll put it at like the top of the page that we render all the other different pages, which is this place. Okay, and I am just going to, I'm just going to create this component over here called app shell. I'm creating it inside this file because we don't have much time left. But the proper way to do it is, of course, you do it inside your components folder with its respective style sheet and everything. Okay, and I'm just gonna add the app shell here. And of course, we need to import the components. And the components they use here is app bar, two bar, and yeah, app bar, two bar, menu icon. Menu icon and typography. Okay. And right now there's this JSX error because again, this needs to be inside a fragment. And it needs icon button as well, icon button. Okay. And the classes here are not defined. So we're just gonna take that away for now. And you will see that we have a missing import again button.
Okay, in this is an interesting error. You likely forgot to export your component from the file. No, I did. No, this doesn't require an export because it's in the same file. This doesn't work for now because of Okay, I'm just gonna like put this here to test. Okay, this is very strange. Somehow this isn't working. Um, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna continue from the sandbox because we don't have much time left. Um, this is sandbox number. 17. All right, so yeah, so this is our, our app show at the moment. So over here, Let me refresh this again. Yeah, over here, basically you have the same thing as we had earlier, but we just have a, yeah, we have an app bar over here and the app shell, and then we just render the app shell over here like that. Okay, was I missing anything? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let me just change this around. Okay, I'm not gonna meddle with this for now. So I'm just gonna continue from here. So, okay, again, I can sign in. Sign in with my account. And over here, I have a logout button. Okay, so when I click on it, basically it just copied some emoji into the file. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very curious what I, did, what I did wrongly here, but yeah, you might be right. There might be some copying error I did, but it's okay. Uh, over here, so basically I created a logout button. Okay, uh, essentially I just copied the code from that, from that component example, and then we just pass in the Firebase to handle logout using a Firebase off. And when that happens, it just um, calls Firebase off dot sign up. And that's how I log out. Okay, log out, log in. Okay, so because this is using my other sandbox, I'm just gonna go back to the other sand, no, the other project. Yeah, I call it, name it anything. Yeah, so over here, you can see that, oops, I'm sorry, one of you used my app, so you see your email here. Yeah, so I registered with my email, and then you, you will create an entry in your Firebase authentication. And basically, it will show you that, okay, the, uh, I registered with my Google account, that's, that's it, okay? Then the next thing I'm gonna show is, Yep. So why? So this whole concept about uh, app shell, right? Is we try to, as much as possible, render the thing that doesn't change in our app. Okay. So like for example, this is the top bar over here. This top bar, we it doesn't change a lot. It's used as like a navigation. So we call it the app shell because it's like a shell for like your whole app, and we just like render it somewhere. 
at the top and the we only change like the pages that we display over here so it gives a very app like experience like when you click on logout you don't see the page refreshing at all this thing still stays here you click on sign in with google and i sign in and it still works right so it just feels very natural and it, it makes your app feel very performant if you like have an app shell and you just only change the things that you want to change. Okay, so this is the logging out part. So next, uh, yeah, we are four minutes until five o'clock. So if you guys need to leave, uh, please go ahead because once again, I'm running over time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just make sure I continue all the way to the end, okay? Yeah, so there'll be a recording, uh, the recording will be uploaded. Yeah, next, so what we're going to move on next is we are going to personalize this whole thing even more. So over here, right, you see that I pass in a use, user object over here. What I'm going to do over here is I'm, gonna, I'm just going to like print out the user object. Okay, I guess I can't do that. Um, I can I can put it here though. Yeah. Console.log user. Yep. Okay. So right now I'm printing out the user object that was passed into this, this thing. And you can actually see that the type of information you get is actually quite interesting. Okay, over here you get like a photo URL. Okay, you get a display name. And you get like an email address. You can even see if their email is verified or not, that type of thing. Okay. So these are the type of things that using a social login will help you to do. Because if you suppose you sign up with Facebook or anything, then it will just give you like their photos, their their, their names. Okay. Uh not in a creepy way, but it's to help you to make a more personalized app experience. Okay. So over here, I'm gonna show you that there's this um where is it? Uh, there's this component called avatar in um, Material UI React. So this Material UI React, this avatar thing actually allows you to just pass in this um, like a URL to an image and then you will just seem, you will just be a circle and, and stuff. And you can actually combine this avatar thing with this menu component. Okay, this menu component, when you click on it, it pops out and then there's like, you can do like different things with it. With like, like you can have a profile, you can log out and stuff. So again, the full code is inside here. It's really just copy and paste and you just put them together. So instead of having an open menu here, you replace this open menu with the avatar. And for the avatar, when you try to make it work, where is it? Avatar you pass in the user's name as like the alternate text and you pass in the user's photo URL into the source. And what you get here is, you actually get this thing over here, okay? Again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna show you the, me copying the code. I'm just gonna show you how the code after I copied it from that page looks like, okay? User object we had just now. I pass it into an avatar. And over here, there's this menu as well. This is also copied from like the, the, the same page. And there's a menu item called logout. Okay, so again, the same thing. When I click on logout, it passes handle logout with like Firebase and it logs me out. And over here, there's just a, a bunch of states that the menu component requires. Okay, and of course, when I handle logout, I also remember to close the menu as well. And this is how it looks like. Okay, over here, if I click on it, then I can have a logout thing. And somehow it's not showing my photo URL. So this thing, from my testing, it works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. You, sometimes you will see like your Google accounts photo. Sometimes it just gives you like the normal default uh, photo URL, which is like a circle with like your first letter on it, okay? Yep, so this is for the new app shell. You can just click on it, have a fancy menu, click on logout. You can explore the code on your own. 
So next, what we're going to do is, right now the authentication actually works completely already. I can log out, I can sign in. Then when I sign in, if you already log in, why would we auto log out if you refresh? Uh, let me try. Okay, there's a question on whether it will auto log out if you refresh. I don't think it does. Oh, hey, look, I just pasted the link here and my photo URL is here and I didn't need to log in. Okay, so even if I hard refresh the page, you will check, you, you see that momentary fresh, uh, flash of like login screen. Uh, yeah, that's cause it's still checking whether I'm logged in or not. But once it, it checks that I'm logged in, it will just show me this page. Yeah, so that's the thing. Firebase handles everything for you. It doesn't require you to store like cookies to determine whether the user is logged in or not. Okay, then we have this fancy thing here. Okay, so next I am going to talk about Firebase um, Firestore. So... I am going to, I'm just going to switch to switch to my other project. Anything will do. This is a new one so that we can create a Firestore database from scratch. Okay. So Firestore database, when you, you need to set it up, so you need to create a database and you can determine if you want to start in test mode or production mode. Uh, I think test mode is more, it's easier to like develop with and all. But because it, the, the, the rules are less strict, but for, the, for this tutorial, I'm just going to start in production mode. So over here, you need to determine where you want to store your database. Okay, This is important because right, um, you want your app to work fast. So if, if, you, if you store like your database in like the US, when most of your users are in Singapore, then it's going to take longer for us to like reach our database and the latency will be longer. So as much as possible, we try to choose a region that's like nearest to us. So the nearest to us is actually Asia Southeast 2. And Asia Southeast 2 is a server in Jakarta. Yeah, I think it's in Jakarta. Um, you can check that out yourself. Uh, you just Google the name of the Google, the, the code, then you'll find out like where these servers are located. So there are servers in Singapore as well. It's Asia Southeast 1, but it's not in this list over here. So the next best we can go for is Asia Southeast 2. Okay, these are all Google Cloud service regions. And I'm going to enable it. Then it's going to take a while to enable again. But meanwhile, um, I'm going to show you the next sandbox. Okay. So this is the next sandbox, the one that already that we are already able to save to like Firestore. Um, refresh. Okay, it's still setting up the rules. It's going to take quite a while. So Sandbox 19, save to Firestore. So essentially, you need to remember to add your dependencies, add your Firebase Firestore. Okay, Firebase Firestore. And you probably, you are looking at this React Firebase, right? Then you're wondering why didn't I add React Firebase slash Firestore. Okay, so if you look at this React Firebase library, they actually do support Firestore as well. Okay. Um, over here, we are at Firestore getting started and you there's like instructions step-by-step -step on how to do it. They will tell you to add React Firebase, Firestore and, and the same thing again, Fire, Firestore com provider and etc. They even give you code samples on how to change the database. But I chose not to use this React Firebase Firestore because I tried using, I tried following the, the whole set of instructions here and trust me, this is very buggy. So you can tell that this library also isn't that well maintained because even the Firestore getting started page, it says React real-time database when it's probably just like a copy and paste from the React real-time database documentation, but they just forgot to like change it. Okay, so this is this isn't very well well maintained, and when I used it, right, there were some bugs. So you can try it out yourself on your own time if you want to try using this library. But for me, I decided to just like do it myself. Okay, so what I mean by that is, 
okay, come, we have our Cloud Firestore now. So right now, this is our database and we need to like determine the type of data that we want to save, okay? So for example, the, the, the type of things you want to save is we want to save like tasks, okay? Then we can have like a parent path. Then um, you need to determine like the shape of like your database, okay? And for, for, for the shape to take place, right? It first needs to have like the first item. So over here, you can just click on auto ID and you just fill up with anything. And then we need to determine like the type of information we're going to solve. So no, no, we're going to, no, we're, the type of information we're going to store, sorry. So we're going to store tasks and tasks will be stored in, we have, a, we have an array of tasks, right? So tasks will be stored in an array. So we'll just choose the array type. Okay. And over here, uh, we can, we can choose to spe specify whether we want to like, uh, actually like put in what the items you want to put inside the array are. But for now, we're just going to set, set this to now because uh, it, it, it still works. Okay. We're just going to save it. So over here, you have a task collection and and, and then the, the shape of the data basically it allows you to save like a task or array of like different objects. Okay. So back to this um, task manager thing. Okay. So, so basically what I've done so far is uh, because number one, you first need to import the Firebase Firestore library. This is the one by Google, not, not, the, not the bad library that's from React Firebase. So this is the one from Google. You need to import it so that your Firebase actually has the Firestore uh, capability. Okay. So after you've added this, next, what you want to do is um, you are we are going to just go to like task manager. So right now we want to save all our tasks into like Firestore, right? So we need to go to the part of our code where we actually save our tasks. So uh, we actually save our tasks over here. So when we add a new task, then we set task, right? And whenever we want to change the completion of the task, we also like set the task. But there is an actual, there's actually a, a pretty intuitive way to write this thing that makes your code very reactive. Okay, like it's a, we call it reactive programming where we essentially just use a use effect hook, okay, use effect hook, and we use it to watch for any changes in the task. Okay, if there are any changes, an update to our Firestore database will be dispatched. Okay, so we watch for like this task state, and whenever the task state changes, this effect is run. Okay, so over here, What's happening here is there's this Firebase thing. Then uh, you could do like the very convoluted like uh, off provider, then you pass down the Firebase object thing. But we could also just directly import it from Firebase slash app. Okay, so we could also directly import it from Firebase slash app. And this allows you to directly access the Firebase object. Then next, um, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to fetch the current user's user ID. So uh, I'm not sure if you all saw just now, but when we when I went to print out like the, the user object, right? Um, every user is actually given like a, a unique identifier. So uh, I'm going to open up the authentication thing for the one I had earlier. Okay, so over here, every user is actually given like a unique UID that is only specific to your app. And this can be used to uniquely identify them in your app. Okay, so we can use this as a key to store like our Firebase, uh, no, our Firestore data entries. Okay, I'm gonna close all the other sandboxes here because it's kind of confusing. Close, close, close. Okay, so we can get the, the current UID, the unique ID of the user or the user ID. 
with by calling firebase.off, then you get the current user and then we get a UID. Okay, so this syntax will be new to you. So what's this question mark and dot thingy? This is what we call optional chaining. Okay, because the thing is uh, sometimes current user might give you now and when that happens, if you try to call UID on a now object, on like a now, it's kind of like a now pointer exception, your code will kind of crash. So we want to do, we want to account for the fact that it might be now, but yeah, most of the time we actually know that it won't be now. Uh. So this is called optional chaining. Okay. So over here, we get the UID. And afterwards, that's how we initiate like a database connection. So how I actually got this snippet of code, basically you just go to the Firebase docs and then you, you visit um, add data to Firestore. Okay, or uh, actually you just Google add data to Firestore. You will find like the documentation right here, the first result. Okay. Once again, go in and then you can just copy the code here. So uh, db dot the name of the collection, the name of the document, and then the type of the, the, the attributes that you want to set. Okay, so same thing over here db.collection, we want to set the task collection over here and the document UID, we, are, we will set it to, um, for this document, we'll set the task attribute to like the new task that we received inside this use, use effect. Okay, so what this essentially does is whenever you make any change to your task, you will just commit it to like your Firestore database. No, yeah, Firestore database. So I'm just gonna do like a short demo here. Uh, okay, I'm gonna show you the, the one that I've already set up previously. Okay, so over here, what you can see here is like the Cloud Firestore database. And this is a task collection. Then these are like a few tasks that some of you guys have already written over here. And I think from, for me, no, this was the, the other person who used it. Yeah, so for me, this is this is me, okay? So I have a teach React workshop over here and what I'm gonna do now is, I'm just gonna refresh this. Um, yeah, so over here I have a whole bunch of tasks. The moment I tick one of these, I make a change, you will just send it to Firebase and you will update on the spot over here, okay? I'm gonna take it now. And then you see again, test, meow, 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 meow. This should work, this should work. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, when you, if when I untick this, you can see it's complete becomes false. Okay, take again, true, false. Okay, so this is what our code does. Every time you update your task, you will just directly commit it to your Firestore database, and then you'll be stored there in Firebase. Okay, so now that we've done this, the next step is really just to display it, which I'm gonna show in Sandbox 20. Okay, so this is Sandbox 20. Over here, you see the again test, meow, meow, meow. That's because um, over here in Sandbox 19, when we ticked it, okay, when I tick completed, over here, it's still not ticked, right? But if I refresh this page, it will fetch from the database and then you see computer is ticked. Okay, so how we actually do the reading of our state from Firebase, basically you need to go to where we actually display, where we actually fetch the task for the first time, okay? The, the place where we, where we fetch a task for the first time is, is, um, is where we, at, the, at first we use like, local storage. So that's probably in page to do list. Okay. So page to do list at first, page to do list, we had this use effect. Okay. Where it reads from the local storage and then it sets the task state. So instead of reading from local storage now, what we want to do is we want to read from Firestore. Okay. We want to read from Firestore. So for us to read from Firestore, essentially we just uh, do the same thing, get your UID, and then create an instance of your database. 
And then you go to your collection, go to the document, and then you just try to get it and get the data. Then you extract the task from its data, and then, and then you set this as your task state. Okay, so how do you know how to find code like that? Again, if you Google for how to get data from Firestore, this is the first result you see. And then you just look at this over here. You can literally just copy and paste the code and adapt it. Uh, no, this is getting data. You need to get a document. So you get this, get this, then you, it gets a promise. Then you need to like unwrap the promise inside to see if like the document exists. If it exists, then you get the data from inside of it. Okay. And just by doing that, our app actually just retrieves the data from Firestore already. It no longer has anything to do with local storage. And this is actually your complete to-do list app. Okay. Uh, so if you were to visit this link right now, okay, if you were to visit this link, uh, suppose if I open up like Firefox, like this browser that I've completely never used at all, right? And we shouldn't have the information over here. Uh, where's my Firefox? Okay, Firefox appeared. I visit this link. So right now, it will, I will be logged out. Okay, and if I were to sign in, and I were to sign in with my Google account, uh, what you see here is my tasks are all persisted from the internet and it's all safe and it's all shown on my on, on my app okay so ready this is 20 cent boxes our whole to-do list app now is done okay so now that i've kind of explained the whole code already the next question is do you think the app is buggy and do you think the app is secure okay and the answer is the app is actually kind of slightly buggy. It's slightly buggy. And the app is actually not secure. Okay. So what I mean is that right now the app is buggy because if you somebody uses a to-do list on multiple device, the task might not be updated correctly because um, we only fetch from Firestore when we first load. But suppose if I were to fetch on like Google Chrome, Okay, I, if I were to fetch over here, uh, I were to, sorry, if I were to fetch my task over here, then I were to fetch again on like Firefox. Then right now, I, I'm going to mark these two as this should work. Okay, but, okay, if I, and if I were to refresh this, you will see this should work. These two are still over here. Yeah, these two are still tick. But right now in Chrome, I'm still using an old state of it. Okay, this was already loaded. This is still an old state. Then right now I try, I take try again. Okay. If I were to go to, to Firefox and I refresh again, you will see these two ticks magically disappear and the other tick magically be ticked. Okay. So that's the bug that I'm talking about. And it's also not very secure because right now right, anybody can actually read or write to other users tasks because what you need to know about front-end apps is that all the code that we've written here eventually all of them including your api keys and everything will just be sent over to the, the user's web browser as like plain html css and javascript okay so because because like uh, that's how web browsers work somebody can actually just like change like the your collection or like the UID and end up just like reading other people's to do or writing into other people's to do. Okay, so our app is not secure. And for you to make it secure, you need to actually like write Firestore security rules. Okay, Firestore security rules. Uh, basically, they are the, the rules that determine whether you can like save or write to certain documents on the on firebase or not and i forgot to mention but when you actually start on like firebase firestore sorry firebase firestore uh 
anything will do. So if you go to Firestore database, if you create like a production database, right? By default, the rules over here, it will have a allow read write if false. Okay, so you look at this and you see allow read write if false, right? Which means nobody can write. Which, uh, yeah, nobody can read and nobody can write. So for you to actually get started with like making your to do list working right, you need to change to if true. Okay. This means this, this allows anyone to read and write. And for you to make it secure, you need to make these rules to be even more strict so that only the users with who, have, who are authenticated and have access to like the document, right? Then, then they can do that. Okay, somebody is posting on the Zoom chat. Interesting, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so these are the rules well, these are the places where you set up your rules for Cloud Firestore. And for you to get started with like making your insecure to do this app, you need to make this change. Yep, and we are done. Our to do this app is done. And we overran again, again. Okay, so just some last few React tips before I end off. I'm so sorry that I had to rush off the last few Firestore parts and just show you guys a sandbox without live coding, but. I hope that the explanation was clear enough for you to understand how the code works. And if you are a bit lost, just look at the sandbox, play around with it, really. The sandboxes are there for you to play around. So just try and understand the code and you'll be able to do it, okay? So extra React tips, uh, avoid the apocalypse. So what's the apocalypse? Apocalypse basically just uh, try to break down your parts into like components where you don't really have to pass way too many props like that, okay? So uh, this Ken C Dots guy, I think he's like a pretty influential guy in React. Then he was like asking for people who have like way too many props. Then people were like, oh, that's called a prop collapse. Okay. Simple, reusable and composable components like we've done so far. Um, our, my to-do list can, can be even be broken down into like smaller components, but we didn't have time to do that. But so try to make sure you write simple, reusable and composable components. Okay. If you're designing a long form with lots of inputs, don't manually do it with use state or use effect because it's a huge pain to um, do it with just use state and use effect. You should use something like React Hooks form. So that's like a tip that I'll give you. Give you. And of course, use more React hoops, Hooks and learn to write your own React Hooks. Okay. So click on these links and you guys will probably like see like interesting looking hooks over here. So uh, for example, you have um, this use dark mode hook, which just tells people whether dark mode is enabled or not. Okay. Then there's even like a use local storage hook, that type of thing. So uh, I mean, these are not the best uh, but it's a reference to for you to see how other people write useful hooks that they can use. And this is a guide for you to write your own hooks. Okay. Uh, CSS tips. Please don't ever, ever write exclamation mark important in CSS. Okay. So sometimes when you write CSS rules, right, then and certain things don't really work, certain colors don't really show up, then you'll be like, why doesn't it work? Then the quick escape hatch is, of course, to write exclamation mark important. But the thing is, this will actually lead to a lot more problems down the line because uh, you're actually not writing CSS rules properly. You should write, learn to write rules or better CSS specificity. Okay, and again, use make styles or, or style components for CSS and JS. And if you want to use like, uh, you want to separate your CSS and your, your JS files, uh, then you should learn to use like SAS modules or CSS modules. Okay, which we, which we covered earlier as well. Uh, avoid inline styles. So in my code sandboxes, you see a lot of inline styles, but that's because we are very short of time. And um, you should use CSS media queries for mobile responsiveness, okay? Mobile responsiveness basically means that your app should look good and work well, whether you're using a desktop, whether you're using a phone, whether you're using a tablet, okay? So CSS media queries will help you to do that, okay? And yeah, let me just quickly show you an example of how to use your 
browser developer tools to check for mobile responsiveness. Okay, so I'm gonna show you this chat app I, I made recently. Okay, so this is a chat app I made recently uh, for me and my friends when we want to play games. So then we just like type in a channel name, we can just hop on the same call and we can like play games together. Like, you know, games like Dota and all. Okay, so when you want to see whether like this web page is actually responsive, open your browser console, open, no, open your browser dev tools, click on this button, toggle device toolbar. And what you see is, you see this responsive thing, Okay, I'm gonna just refresh this and I'm just gonna resize it. And you will see that at a certain point, when it reaches like a mobile viewport, when it's below seven, six, eight pixels, it will just resize and it will just fit my phone screen. Okay, so that's how you kind of test whether something is responsive or not. And there's even like presets. If you want to see how your app will look like on iPhone, iPhone X, then this is, these are the iPhone X pixel dimensions. If you want to see how your app will look like on like a Galaxy S3, a super old phone, then this is how it will look like. Right now it's not centered because uh, I need to refresh it. Yeah, but then my app is responsive. So you should, if you are designing your app for both desktop and mobile, that's how what you should aim for as well, make it responsive. You can even do things like uh, throttling your internet to make it or uh, throttling your your phone to make your phone very slow so suppose your phone is a low-end mobile phone then you refresh it then you will see actually how a slow phone would load the app so you can see it actually takes some time to render everything on the screen so your browser tools are really very very powerful okay i can even like highlight my app okay this is my react app this is my form okay then you can see like the type of CSS styles that are applied over here. Okay, let me try to make it bigger for you guys to see. The type of CSS styles that are applied over here. And um, your, your any padding it has, any border it has, any margin it has. Okay, your browser tools are really very powerful. And coupled with like your React developer tools, you make your life a lot easier. All right. And... The summary is today, the app that we've made today is this. This is our finished product. Okay. Uh, essentially, it's the same as what we had last week. It's just that it's prettier. It actually saves on the internet instead of just saving it locally. Okay. So the recap is try not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, as software engineers, being lazy is actually good. Just try to like search for libraries that help you make your life easier. Okay, what I mean is suppose uh, you wanted to make a drag and drop thing like in, like you know how NUS mods has drag and drop, right? So you can just look for like react, drag and drop. And you, you, you see that it has, there's like libraries over here that completely help you to abstract over it and make it easy for you to drag and drop. Uh, yeah, I think this is what, this is what NUS mods uses, react beautiful D and D. Okay, you can look at this. Everything is abstracted away from you already. Uh, over Zoom, this might look a bit laggy, but, but on my screen, it actually looks very smooth. So the dragging and everything looks very smooth. Uh, if you need like inspirations on like what projects are using, of course, you can look at like NUS mods. Okay, NUS mods. Yeah, so NUS mods. Okay, of course, it's a full React app. So right now you guys are actually good enough to contribute to the NUS mods. You actually find any bugs or anything that you don't like about it. So this is the NUS mods uh, GitHub repository. Then this is like the website folder. So inside the web this website folder, you can see like the type of libraries that NUS mods uses. So they have a, a ton of dev dependencies and they have like these dependencies over here, right? So they use uh, what do they, yeah, they use React Beautiful drag and drop, like I mentioned earlier, okay? So, uh, there's even things like React Kawaii, which is like, what's that for, right? I can show you, basically it's a library of cute illustrations. They are easily customizable. Okay, so I think if you go to like a 404 page on like NUS mods, then you go to like slash Chris, 
then it will show you like some cute stuff over here. And I think this is rendered with like uh React Kawaii. So really, there's a lot of libraries out there. Pick something that you like. There's I recently even found one that for you to animate explosions. So there's like React explosions, some more. Okay. So just look at the projects that you like and then see like the type of the type of um, libraries that they use. It'll be very helpful for you. Okay. So uh, don't be afraid of like React code. Just read more code and write more code. You end up being like a much better developer. Uh, control C, Control V is good, uh, but of course you must ensure that you understand what you're copying and pasting. Okay. So wireframe first, design first, then code later. So um, I think this is a step that a lot of people will end up skipping. Okay. So between you and your teammate, you guys will probably like need to think about oh, what's the best way to design your app. Uh, and you guys will probably know that, oh, I will need like a login screen. I will need like a dashboard screen. But the thing is you and your teammate might have different ideas on the requirements of each of these screens. So uh, usually what I recommend is people use uh, Figma. So Figma is this tool that is used to like uh, draw out wireframes, draw out, it's, it's drag and drop, it's fully drag and drop, okay? So you and your teammate can just collaborate on the same document and uh, Students have a free Figma Pro license as well. You can just search for Figma for education. So you should just draw out all your workflow, no, all your screens first, so that you and your you and your teammates don't miss out on any requirements. And you, you guys can agree on each other on like uh, uh, how to actually design your actual web app. Okay. Because if, if you just start coding blind, right? If you just start coding blind, you're then you won't really know how to lay out your items. You won't really, you and your teammates, uh, suppose you think, oh, we need to have requirements A and B. Then your teammate thinks, oh, we need requirements B and C. Then when one of you code them, you end up only capturing like part of the picture. But when you and your teammate draw together, you actually see how um, you will move from like screen to screen, how each screen will look like, how the user would actually interact with like the whole app itself. And, Figma also comes with a lot of like uh, very um, free kits where you can just kind of copy and paste it, okay? To very quickly like just come up with a quick wireframe. Okay, so yeah, uh, Bennett just uh, talked about the hack and roll wireframe. So let me just show the, where's the hack and roll wireframe? Yeah, so earlier this year, um, when I was like uh, working on the hack and roll front end, the hack and roll front end is actually designed completely in React and completely designed by ourselves. So hack and roll is like uh, the NUS hackers hackathon, right? So the whole site is designed by ourselves. And this was the old dashboard and I decided to revamp it. So um, I decided to make it like intuitive and like easy to navigate around. You have like a whole, uh, easy to look at the, like the content and all and join the Discord, you can, edit your details, you can even like click around to move to different screens, okay? So this was like a very preliminary idea of like the hack and roll website, the, the, the new dashboard, which, we, which I actually coded it out and we actually deployed it this year in hack and roll. And yeah, and so, so like I was going for like, you know, these are buttons which are very elegant, okay? I took inspiration from this picture over here, okay? So take inspiration and like code out your buttons, code out your, no, don't code it out yet. Draw, draw them out first. Draw them out in a way that you are happy with it, that you actually like how it looks. Then try to think of a way, of, of a flow that actually makes a lot of sense for you, for the users, okay? So over here, what we aimed at over here is that you can actually move from like pre-event. What, what do you need to do from pre-event to like day one, okay? You can click left and right to move from day to day. And there's like this timeline type of thing that tells you what you have yet to done, what you have yet to do, and what you can do over here, that type of thing. So, yeah. So this is the hack and roll wireframe. This is the actual thing that I drew out before I started coding, all right? And I think this is a very, very important step, which is, it's very weird that I'm talking about this in the React workshop, right? But I think this is a very important step that you and your teammates should start with. And at, to the, at the end of the day, please remember that Orbiter is really about 
creating something that you care about, creating something that you find fun doing. And at the end of the day, it's really all about creating thoughtful and performance software. All right. And with that, we have come to the end of the workshop. I will overran by 36 minutes, but I hope that you know this workshop was still useful for you guys and you guys learn something new and how to very quickly put together like you know an authenticator web app and all. Uh, the next thing that you guys should really learn is like React Router. Okay, React Router is this thing that allows you to uh just just, just click on React Router for web. Then over here there's a quick start guide. So the quick start guide basically tells you that oh, when you go to slash about then I will show my about page. When you go to slash users, then I will show my users page, that type of thing. Okay, so again, open source projects are really very self-explanatory. Like, like a lot of the React resources out there are very well documented. So ensure that you learn how to read documentation. And a lot of times really, it's just copying code, putting them together, and you can come up with something that looks very good that didn't really put you that didn't really require you to put in a lot of effort to make. All right. Yeah. And that's the end of the workshop. Does anybody have any questions for me? All right, and I guess that's the end of our two-part workshop for React. Uh, I don't I'm not, I'm not teaching any more uh, workshop for mission control this time round. So, uh, but make sure you, if you're interested in UI UX, sign up for the UI UX one next week. Like I said, it's taught by Han Ming. He's very experienced in it. So I think it will be great to hear from him. Okay, if not, um, really have fun working on your projects. Really just think of something that, I think I repeated this like too many times, but work on an idea that you care about, work on an idea that's useful and always, always think about the user and always, always think about product, how people will use it, whether it solves the problem or not. And if there are other products that are already out there in the field, what makes yours any different? Okay, so that's all I have to share with you guys. And I hope that you guys will become great software engineers, great web developers on your own. Have fun. All right, I'm going to end the call. I, yeah.